So uh, for everybody who's uh, tuning in, thank you for staying with us all day. This is wonderful. Uh, we're going to cap off our discussion today with um, sort of an informal discussion between uh, Scott Shapiro and I. Um, Scott, do you want to tell people who you are? So I, am, I, I teach at Yale Law School. Um, I'm a legal philosopher, but I also um, uh, teach and write on cybersecurity. And I had the really smart sense to get to know Sean and have him teach me what he knows. Um, oh, well, actually, teach me as much as I can absorb. Um, um, and we've taught together twice. And it was a great experience. And uh, we're, I, I don't know what we're going to talk about. We'll talk about various uh, cyber stuff. Um, but yeah. So why don't you start with uh, just sort of telling everybody, um, you know, what you're working on, if you'd like, uh, if you want to talk about the viruses and worms, et cetera. And then I have some materials so I can show the folks uh, what we did in class uh, if, if uh, we want to cap it off that way. Okay, sure. Yeah, so um, so, the, so just to, as an as a introduction, my, my story is that when I was in college, well, when I was in high school, um, this was like in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and the PCs just had come out, and uh, I got an Apple II, and I was you know, like so many young people at the time incredibly um uh enamored with uh with personal computing and was just like it was my whole world and then i was a computer science major in college and ha and did a lot of work uh in coding and um had a company that did database construction and it was really a big part of my life and then I stopped it and I went to uh, law school and then I got a PhD in philosophy and I, I kind of stopped the whole um, uh, technical stuff um, and then uh, you know I, I wrote some stuff on the like, philosophy and I and I wrote a book on the laws of war with my uh, colleague on Hathaway called The Internationalists about the outlawry of war in 1928. And uh, what happened was my, uh, a lot of people kept on saying, okay, so you wrote this book about the laws of war over a 400 year period. So we went from basically 1600 to 2014, but there's this thing called cyber war. What does the law have to say about that? And so we thought, oh, we're well, actually this is a really interesting, important question. Let's try to figure that out. And we got a grant from the Hewlett Foundation for us to teach a course uh, at Yale on the law and technology of cyber conflict. And uh, we taught with uh, Joan Feigenbaum, who is the who, is who at the time was the chair of um, computer science at Yale and a, uh, a world famous uh, cryptographer, a brilliant person. Um, and we had half computer science students and half law students. And um, we taught the law of conflict. Owen and I taught the law of conflict and then Joan taught cybersecurity related stuff um, and it was horrible it was just an absolute terrible disaster um, worst course I ever taught um, it was like half the class was bored and the other class the other half was confused um, so we talked about the law the law students were bored and the computer science people were like what are you talking about and vice versa and the truth is, is that I myself was incredibly um, uh, confused as to what was going on, which was really disconcerting to me because I had spent so much of my life, you know, many years ago, but I thought of myself as like very technically 
uh, adept, and I thought I could pick it up, but I couldn't pick up any of it. It was I, my the the kind of metaphor I always think it, 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 um, comes to mind is that I was like Rip Van Winkle, who um, uh, fell asleep and missed the revolution, and I woke up and I didn't know anything. And then uh, the 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 great breakthrough was I was. Um, sitting next to Jack Balkin, my colleague, and who runs the Information Society Project at, um, at Yale. And I was just saying how, how just how frustrating it was to teach cyber conflict and cybersecurity um, when I, I, didn't, I couldn't figure out the technical stuff and the students couldn't. And they said, oh, there's this guy you should know, Sean O'Brien. Uh, he runs Privacy Lab. So, um, that's, so that's how I got to know Sean. Um, and, um, my, so I, I, I went on, uh, a real kind of learning spree, um, for a bunch of years, really trying to get caught up on the technical side, um, with, um, you know, I knew Unix, but I didn't know Linux and I didn't know tons of things having to do with like, I mean, I, I knew MS-DOS, but I didn't know Windows and I, I knew tons of tons of things. Uh, I, I didn't know tons of things, so I had to learn learn it. And then Sean and I uh, taught our first class together. But I just, th this is all a big way by saying that I got into uh, learning about security um, out of a sense of just sheer confusion as to what the world was like. Um, uh, and so I'm writing a book right now called Insecurity. It's all about how, you know, we live in this information society and we have absolutely no idea. I mean, you know, like everything about our lives. I mean, even now, I mean, we can't meet face to face. This is all about being done virtually. Um, and you know, we talk about how so much of our life is lived online, but now, now it really is. It's not even a metaphor anymore. Um, and so I decided I wanted to write a book which tried to explain what, how we got here, how we got to where we are, and um, what the... What I could talk about it, and this is, I know I've been speaking for a long time, but um, uh, what I could talk about is uh, just what I discovered about viruses and worms. <laughs> but um, let me just stop there because that was way too long of an introduction. No, you're good. You're good. So, uh, I, I mean, this is exactly where I, I was hoping the conversation would go. I think um, your journey over the last two years has been... Um, really accelerated sort of um, boot camp, right? right <laughs> yeah. all this stuff. Um, so I think for the audience, for the folks who are just getting into this, and now in this world that we're in with COVID-19, everybody's online all the time. Um, so we're going to see a new generation of that. Um, we had Corey Doctorow on earlier, and he was talking about, you know, we're going to have to see this new generation is growing up in this environment now, and at least, you know, a big portion of their life, you know, the folks graduating high school, starting college in the fall, whatever that's going to look like, um, you know, they're going to have to learn things quickly and sort of everybody freaking out about Zoom, you know, rightfully so, right, um, is a s symptomatic of that, you know, uh, showing well, people don't know what's going on. They have no idea what's intermediating their conversation. Cyber war is thrown around in commercials, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. And please talk about the uh, viruses and worms. Well, I, I just want to say that, I mean, in some sense, I, I just want to, like, tip my hat. I, mean, I don't have a hat, but tip my hat to you. Because, I mean, you were... You, we're talking about flattening the curve. You were so ahead of it. I mean, you built Privacy Lab at, at Yale, and um, you were worried about these issues. Um, I mean, other people have been worried about them too, but not that many. Um, and, you know, um, 
our life is this now and digital self-defense doesn't feel like an, an esoteric topic now. It feels like uh, having lots on our doors. Um, it's, it's, it, it really, what, what, what you've learned um, and what you've, um, the, the knowledge that you've accumulated over the last number of years is um, going to be just invaluable to, I hope to, so. to, 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 to everyone. The um, flip side of the but, coin is it might not be valuable, right? Um, because we may get so locked into these platforms that, you know, I'm going to be a wild man in the wings again, only a little differently, right? I get, I, you know, it's, it, so that's a, so that's a great question. I mean, do, like, I feel like I don't want to use Amazon. So before I always used Amazon because like it was just, you know, it was just get my stuff quick. I could go to the bookstore or just get it from Amazon. But now I think, wait a second, I don't want to get stuff from Amazon because they really are the only game in town now. So all we've been doing is opening up um, accounts in different local online stores because it's not it's not a threat anymore. It's the reality, right? Um, uh, anyway, so let me let me let me just let me just uh, just talk about um, uh, kind of what what I've been learning about and writing about and researching about for the past. Um, a couple of years. Uh, so I'm writing this book called Insecurity. Um, and what I'm trying to do is trying to just really try to figure out in a very basic way, why is the internet insecure? How do people exploit whatever vulnerabilities are inherent in the internet? and in human psychology and then finally what do we do about it and it's really uh so i start i start um actually in the 1960s where um cyber security it's really actually quite interesting cyber security in the 1960s is really all about protecting the computer like the actual physical thing so they have like ropes so you can't touch the mainframe. There's um, people, you know, people used to shoot mainframes. Did you did you know this, Sean? I, I was, so when 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 um, uh, businesses started to automate, um, the people thought it was the computer that was billing them and the computer that was firing them, and people would go and they would shoot computers. Um, which is quite uh, quite amazing. Um, so there were a lot, lot of incidents of people shooting computers. Um, but um, the, really the book starts um, in 1988 uh, with the uh, famous uh, Morris worm, where a graduate student from Cornell, Robert Tuppen Morris Jr., uh, built a, uh, a worm, uh, uh, to exploit vulnerabilities in Unix and, and Unix applications and released it and made a mistake in the code and ended up crashing the internet. And it's the first real um, uh, internet hack and it really uh, got everyone thinking about cybersecurity. Um, so what, what one of the things that kind of made me, um, that, that, that surprised me as I was doing the research on the Morris worm was, of course, everyone, anyone who knows the topic calls it the Morris worm, but Morris and his friends, they didn't call it a worm, they call it a virus. And then it turned out that there was like a big fight that in the community about whether you would call it a worm or a virus and that there were the worm people and then there were the virus people. And so when um, people would present uh, the uh, studies of the worm at conferences, there would be people who would yell out virus every time somebody, the speaker said worm. Like it was like, kind of reminds me of Rocky Horror, 
the Rocky Horror Picture Show, we'd like the audience would like scream out corrections or or uh, mystery uh, was it mystery uh, mystery science theater three thousand anyway. Um, and so I thought, like, wait a second, it, it, people didn't know what a virus or a worm was. And then the second the second story that I I was following was the um, was um, happened right around the same time, which was the development of computer viruses in Bulgaria. So Bulgaria became the hot spot for uh, virus writing in the late 80s and early 1990s, and all the best uh, viruses came out of Bulgaria. And that really interested me because, well, it's, you know, it's Bulgaria, so it just seems so kind of exotic and interesting. Um, but also, um, I was really interested, like, why did people write viruses and what did they look like and so I had to go I, I had to go back and relearn MS-DOS um, and all the various different interrupts um, in MS-DOS and it was really it was really kind of fun and slightly um, um, uh, bizarre because I mean the thing as you know about uh, computers and computer science is that um, P computer people love documenting what they do and so for a researcher it's fantastic and so you would see I would see these threads um, in forums like frac and uh, um, Fidonet and various things about like who could who can code the smallest virus and so there's this guy in, in uh, Bulgaria who got hit a virus down to 30 bytes, which is really small, 30 bytes. Um, and then I was thinking, and it's really interesting because, you know, a virus can be 30 bytes, but the Morse worm is 60,000 bytes. And I think, well, so why, why is it that viruses can be so small, but worms are so big? What's the difference between viruses and worms that account for this difference? Um, and, you know, it, it's actually really interesting um, now, of course, to think about viruses given COVID and corona and all that stuff. Um, and so I really, I'm a philosopher, so what philosophers do is they do deep dives into concepts and definitions. And so I was just thinking, what really is the difference between a worm and a virus? And then it just actually turned out that um, it's almost impossible to find um, two people using the same definition of what a, a virus is and what a worm is. Um, and so it really interested me, like, really, what is the technical distinction between worm and, and, and virus? Um, and so that's that's... And, what, and why are viruses so small? Why can viruses be so small, but worms tend to be, well, in the case of the Morse worm, it was, it was what, like four orders of, six, uh, one, two, three, four orders of magnitude larger. Um, and so when you, if you look it up, if you look up, you see that um, people say all these different kinds of things about what a what a what a worm is and what a virus is. Some people think of worms as being a kind of virus. Some people think of worms and viruses being different. They think that viruses have to infect files, whereas worms don't have to infect files. And none of those things I think are right. And so then I did research like who made up the term and what were the technical definitions. And so that was really that was really fun. I, let me ask you, just if if you had, Sean, if you had, I'm going to put you on the spot here, um, uh, but w w how would you distinguish between a virus and a worm? So um, I think it's useful often to define things by what they're not, right? Um, yeah, yeah. 
A virus, for example, um, when I was in uh, elementary school, I played around with a TRS-80, which was ancient then. <laughs> yeah. But uh, for us, it was ancient. Um, no, that was my that was my first computer that I that I worked on was the TRS-80, a trash-80, as we call it. Sure. And uh, I mean, I was just screwing around and um, killed the memory on the machine and made it just uh, reboot uh, by filling all the, the the whole memory register. Right um, now that loop right um that broke the machine so to speak that would be a virus maybe um but it's locally contained right um really mm -hmm. simple you're breaking one machine i think a, a a worm that can't be a worm right because a worm has to be delivered ostensibly has to go over a network right um the analogy is is a worm tunneling into something right um so I can at least say that there are viruses that are not worms. <laughs> and then I guess I would say that all worms are viruses, yeah. Yeah, um, so I mean, in some sense, I, I guess what I would say is maybe stipulative, but I think this, tell me whether you think this characterization makes sense to you. And if it doesn't, maybe I'm wrong, um, but um, so, it, it seems as if at one time in computer history, virus just meant malware. So it's like, it's like how I think colloquially we use it today. If, yeah. you, if, you're, if your computer goes on the fritz, you say, oh man, maybe I have a virus. I, I would mean, never... My yeah, generation you, doesn't say worm. <laughs> yeah, like, right, but you you would never say it's a virus. But like, you know, the 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 the, the lay person would be like, oh man, do I have a virus? So like, virus means, I think, to a lay person and to, and originally, I it was used in the sense of things that break your machine. Yeah, um, I think so. Uh, Instead of saying bug or something, people would say virus, maybe. Right, exactly. And maybe you, they would. You'd say, really, any bug? You say, well, no. I think I got, I got it from somebody. So it, there was a, there was a sense in which I, I, I caught it. Um, somebody maliciously right. spread it to me. So you would think of it as maybe propagated malware. Um, as a so, but. So I, I, the historically, um, and of course, you know, there's a lot of urban legends about this. So um, people will claim that these terms really have earlier usages, but in the record, written record, there is a guy, a grad student named Fred Cohen, who. Um, published a dissertation on computer viruses um, in 1985, and he actually ran experiments. He, let, he really ran experiments. He let viruses go in contained networks, um, and uh, they, and he gave a mathematical characterization of what a virus was. Um, and he, it's in interesting, he regrets using the word virus. Um, he, re he thinks it was a big mistake for him to use the word virus. So in 1984, he published part of his dissertation. So that's the first written record of the word virus being out there. Um, and he regrets it because he was, he was a believer. I don't know if he still is, um, but he was a believer that actually propagating, replicating programs could be good. And he thought that viruses connoted malevolence. And he spent a lot of his time um, trying to figure out how to write a good virus. And I, I, you may know these people, but there's like a whole, there's a, there's a big, um, I don't know, big, but there's a contingent of computer people who who work in a field called artificial life. Do you know this? Do you, do you know people like this, Sean? 
Um, I, yeah, I have a uh, pretty extreme skepticism of it. <laughs> but, yeah, okay, sure. but I mean, there, so so there's the artificial life society. There are people, and and I, you know, a lot of their work is based on um, uh, traces to um, John Conway. You know, who wrote the Game of Life? Who, I I mean, I believe died of COVID recently. <laughs> Yeah, he died, what, like a week ago? I think it was of COVID. Um, and, and he was 83 years old. Um, a great mathematician and wrote the famous Game of Life, um, which many of you might have seen. Um, and I think it's actually quite poignant that um, this was this work um, of Cohen's was developed in the early 1980s when the AIDS crisis was so um, uh, was so in everyone's consciousness um, in 19 was it 1983 uh, scientists discovered that AIDS was was caused by the HIV virus um, and um, it just kind of if you will in the air that uh, viruses uh, that that there could be malevolent instructions um, that would be passed from person to person. And I think it's also very poignant to me that so many bu young Bulgarian men who would write viruses to pass to each other during the AIDS crisis um, that's rabid, but that just destroying so many communities. Um, it's almost as if kind of acting out this this trauma um, that so many people are were, were, were so many young men were um, experiencing at the time. Well, anyway, so that's the, that's the term virus. Worm comes from uh, Shock Rider. Have, have you ever read Shock Rider? No. no. Okay, so Shock Rider is a 1975 science fiction novel um, about um, uh, a, a dystopian future where, um, where only rich people have privacy. Um, uh, uh, the every, uh, most people don't have privacy, only rich people have privacy. And so the hero, Nick, uh, creates what he calls a worm, which takes down the network, which robs everyone of privacy. So a worm there is something that you know, is somewhat autonomous um, based on a tapeworm that um, leaves segments of its tail, which has eggs to um, to to hatch and to grow into other other worms. Um, and so, what what happens at this time? This is all happening in the seventies and eighties, and people are trying to figure out: well, what are we going to attach the term virus to and where are we going to attach the word worm to and um this is what i think happens i think what happens is, is that both viruses and worms are 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 part of the genus of malware which have three properties okay one is that they're self-replicating Okay, that they can copy themselves. Okay, that's the first thing. So, you know, Zoom can't copy itself. I mean, Zoom, Zoom doesn't want it to copy itself. Um, most software can't copy itself. Um, viruses and worms are malware that copy themselves as self-replicating, is the first thing. And number two, they're propagating. That is, they multiply and spread. So you can imagine um, a program that can replicate itself, but it can't spread. It can't spread because, let's say, it overwrites, it overwrites itself. So you have to have um, self-replication and propagation. But the third thing I think that all viruses and worms have in common is that their self-replication and their propagation are recursive. So it's not just that a virus and a worm can copy itself and multiply and spread, but that's true of their children and of their children's children and of their children's children's children. And that's what creates what we would call virality. The idea that it's not just enough that um, 
uh, you can create offspring like a donkey and a horse, but that the but that the the offspring itself can create can copy itself and propagate. And so what I think so I think in usage people consider like a Trojan, like a Trojan horse is malware, but is not self-propagating and not self-replicating. Um, whereas, would you say that was true? Well, I mean, I guess um, I'm a l little bit of a victim of um, my time, so to speak, <laughs> because when I was growing up, yeah, and obviously the example I gave of just doing something on one machine, um, we probably would just use the word virus for that, but I guess it's incorrect, right? The self-propagating nature is not there. Um, yeah. So I think you would just say, you wouldn't say I wrote a virus because like, it seems like viruses need to be infectious. No. Well, nowadays I probably wouldn't say that anyway. I would probably just say, you know, I wrote some simple script or hack or something like that. But, um, okay. But keep going on about the Trojan okay. thing because I'm interested to, to hear what, because I've heard a lot of self-replicating Trojans <laughs> called Trojans. Okay, so the question the, the 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 question is: Do do they have the three properties? Are they self-replicating? Are they propagating? And is that self-replication and propagation recursive? So does it just continue um, on? Um, so what then is the difference between a virus and a worm? So it seems to me the difference between a virus and a worm. And, and what I'll try to say is it's not just purely definitional. It actually, ex it's explanatory. Um, a, a, so you have these replication propagation cycles, which are recursive. So offspring have these properties too. And the question is, what triggers the cycle? So a worm triggers its own cycle. So it's not just the, it, it's not just recursively replicating and propagating, but it's triggering its own replication and propagation. Whereas a virus requires a user to do it, and that. So you think I, I think of worms as self-powered, whereas viruses are user-powered, and and the fact that. One's self-powered and the other one is user-powered explains why worms are so much more complex than viruses. Because a worm, let's take the let's take the virus first, is user-powered. The virus has like an easy job. It just has to trick you. And you are not you, because you're really hard to trick. But the ordinary person is really easy to trick. And so a virus, in order to be able to engage in the recursive propagation and replication, just has to trick a user. And once he tricks the user, the user executes it and that propagates it. Um, whereas a worm has to trick an operating system. It has to trick a network. And that requires a lot of coding. That requires a lot to... Um, to enable um, some, something that is designed not to allow um, self-propagating, replicating uh, malware to run amok, to trick it into doing it. And that requires it to be so much bigger. And so I always think about viruses. The viruses are trying to trick humans, whereas Worms are trying to trick computers, and that ex that explains. I th anyway, that's my my attempt to try to make sense of usage. So it would turn out then that viruses and worms are different from each other, even though they. I would say that they were sp different species of the same genus. Yeah. So the interesting thing, and I think uh, one of the great things about the exercise is. Um, and obviously this is why it's good for a book, um, you're sort of going through the history, um, coming up with something that has explanatory power, um, but also it's it's something that you can use as an analogy throughout the cases that you're talking about, right? Um, right, exactly, yeah. 
I guess yeah, I and, just yep, go for it. No, I would just say like this is a, like the, this is what you. I mean, I, I it the villain, at least uh, the part of the story of the 1990s I'm writing now, the villain is Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah, because Microsoft, like, took viruses and kind of made them worm-like. Um, it, it, what it did was it, like, turn, it turned um, the internet into a viral super spreader so that it could send it out to zillions of users like by you know getting hold of your outlook address book and all i had to do was trick a certain percentage of uh, of users and that would that would have a very large r0 as we would say now or since we're all epidemiologists now we can i could say r i could say r0 and everyone will know what i mean um, um, and so and in fact, actually, it used to be that, as you know, viruses spread through sneaker net. You know, like it spread because somebody took an infected floppy and walked it over and put it in their computer and infected their computer. Whereas, whereas what Microsoft did was it it turned what should have been a manual process into an automatic process and then made Antivirus protection manual. So, like you're reading these, reading right. these stories of the history of Windows is just outrageous. Like you, know, like, in order they, they create, in order to per, see if you have a virus in an email attachment, you have to download every one of your attachments and then run a third-party manual antivirus screen on it. I have to say, and I, I'm, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to speak ill of somebody who's doing good right now. But the the um, the outpouring of praise for Bill Gates now, um, you know, because he's, you know, the full I mean, it's great. And everything else, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's great that he's donating all this money. The Gates Foundation is fantastic, but my lord what that man did in order to try to choke off innovation and and the the cost that he externalized onto the world for the sake of what um you know is is really upsetting um, yeah i mean i always say um bill gates has taken more time off my life than anyone, <laughs> anyone you know hypothetical but yeah i mean i wouldn't say very nice things about the Gates Foundation in general, but that's that's a different story. Um, I do think that in in reaction to this crisis, um, he's become uh, sort of a central figure because of the ID uh, 2020 stuff, talking about contact tracing and so on. Um, so that'll be interesting yeah. for the audience. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow, so we'll try to put a cap on that, okay. uh, the contact tracing privacy issues, um, which Gates is, is part of. Um, so just a, a last thing here on viruses, and then let's talk about the class a little bit, I think. Um, so you correctly point out this sort of evolution, right, uh, where viruses are something that, uh, you know, screw up machines would have to be delivered manually. Um, then uh, the programs become more complex. They start exploiting uh, holes in protocols, network protocols, right? Um, they figure out ways to self-replicate -re uh, without user intervention. Um, but now, uh, and Microsoft is a good example in this way, um, we have uh, basically programs that have uh, command and control, right? Um, so you've got uh, an exploit like Eternal Blue um, in Windows, uh, which may or may not have been put there by the NSA, but um, let's say it, it wasn't, um, and it just happened to appear in the source code. Um, I, 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 we don't have to pretend. I mean, it's yeah. pretty, pretty, no, it's pretty yeah. yeah, yeah. There's skepticism about it with with some folks. So I'm just kind of being facetious, but um, right. but anyway. So uh, that hole's in the operating system. That hole's exploitable, 
um, sits there for a really long time, and then uh, all of a sudden WannaCry gets delivered through this uh, through this hole, and then that's improved upon. The ransomware gets improved upon, uh, becomes not Petya, and all these other variants, right? But a lot of those variants rely upon, and ransomware, if it's going to be successful for gathering money, um, relies upon manual intervention in a sense, right? Um, you've got command and control centers, um, at least servers that are set up by users. So what do we call this stuff now? Um, so I think WannaCry is a worm. Um, and it's, it, it is, it's, uh, so it's user spread, though it's um, uh, controlled um, so let, let, I, maybe I put it this way, it's client spread, um, but that's still um, compatible with there being manual servers, uh, 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 somebody manually um, uh, commanding and controlling the, the, the clients. Um, that, that's, that, that, as you know, that, that's, that's the better situation. The worst situation is when you don't have command and control, when you have peer-to-peer, -peer, when these when these um, uh, bot infected botnets are not even communicating with the with the C2 with the with the command and control center, but the com where they're communicating with each other, and that's a that's a that's a that's a nightmare. I mean, I just I I don't want to interrupt you, but I, it just this feels. This discussion, it feels, I mean, it's in some sense, we're not talking about COVID, but we are talking about COVID. It's like the government has completely left us all, like we're all the risk has been shifted or not taken off of ordinary people in the name of making us safer and yet it's making us less safe i mean it's destroying our infrastructure it's just um, I, I, when it comes to the ransomware stuff it's destroying our economy with the covid stuff it's like the lack of investment in um in protection of citizens, which is what you know, kind of the basic principle of why the state's supposed to exist. Yeah, um, and I, I think, um, so uh, institutions have made massive amounts of wealth um, and uh, obviously corporations, startups, and farms, but also big tech, as we call it now, right? Um, Part of the reason they're able to generate these large sums of money, um, hang on to it, et cetera, is by damaging the ecosystem, right? Um, having hegemony over parts of it, controlling it um, for purposes that have nothing to do with the user and are usually anti-user, right? Um, so now the fact that we're all being forced to use these intermediaries for everything for real now um, it's not surprising that the response was, well, you're all on your own, figure it out, right? Um, from our, from the state, from government and so on. Um, and yeah. it's, it's just hard for everybody to cope. The educational system, the municipal governments with all the Zoom bombing and everything. I mean, it's starting to get, I'd like to think it's hilarious, but it, it's not, right? Um, no, it's, it's so unfunny. I do not find it. I mean, it's. It, I mean, yeah, I, I, that's one thing I've, like, would it be really funny if somebody, like, all of a sudden walked into your house? Right, right. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly unfunny. Um, Basic, right. Given, yeah, given, given how vulnerable we are to, to, to the, to these platforms. Um, I mean, I have to say, like, I didn't even realize how bad it was until you alerted me on Twitter that there that there's there are people human beings watching our conversations to to protect the vulnerable. I mean, it, and as we know, we know what that means. That normally means young men looking 
at either young men or women. Um, uh, and that kind of surveillance, maybe one thing when it's, surve it's surveillance, um, like what, you know, you know, Facebook or, or Google does, because they're just trying to make money. But here, the conceit is that they're trying to protect us. So there's um, uh, three things going on with the moderation that I think are interesting. Um, the first is, as you identify, look, these video feeds have to go somewhere, right? <laughs> so uh, there's been cases where Snapchat uh, staff, right, have gone through and, and looked at stuff they weren't supposed to look at or wasn't even supposed to be stored for a certain period of time or whatever the situation was, right? Um, and so even there's even in these models where people think they're using technology to auto delete, right? To auto self-destruct, um, there's still so much trust put in the in the technology. Um, and without real verification or a way to sort of look at that and verify that and use the tools we have for verification like encryption and so on, um, you know, how do you know? So, um, so that's one thing. Um, then I think there's also, you know, there's arms of, you know, in a place like Bangladesh or somewhere, although given the way the U.S. economy is going, we'll see it here too. Um, there's going to be moderation farms where people are going to be mm -hmm. doing this, right? Um, it's not good psychologically for people. Um, some of the stuff is really atrocious that comes through these networks. And it, it's, you know, there's a lot of stories out there about folks who need counseling and so on after doing it. And then the third thing, which is happening now, is all of a sudden, uh, big tech just kind of threw the moderation to the AI. <laughs> they just uh, they said, we don't have money anymore to pay even those people, right? Um, so they threw it to the AI. They didn't want to deal with the logistics. They knew that if they just hands up, didn't mon monitor it, moderate it, et cetera, that the backlash from government especially would be severe. Um, so rather you know, create a worse situation and ban all kinds of stuff and moderate stuff that shouldn't be moderated uh, with AI, you know, censor things and take it down um, than the opposite. So I think it's really telling about the way that things work. It's like, I expect drones and uh, restrictions on um, self-driving cars and things like that to also change pretty radically for, for similar reasons. Um, okay, maybe they don't work that well, but it'll get implemented in this environment. So, do you, do, you, do you mean meaning that though that whatever caution that was um, that was holding back self-driving uh, autonomous vehicles uh, uh, of various sorts, cars, drones, um, will all of a sudden be pushed through because. Hey, social distancing. Right. Um, hygiene in general is going to be interesting this way. Um, automation when you go to the grocery store, which was already obviously happening, um, but not to the scale that I think we're going to see it now. Um, oh, that's a, I had not thought of that. That's really fascinating and quite disturbing. So we will eliminate job, even more jobs, human jobs, um, because... Um, of, of contagion concerns. So and the we'll data all... could be more valuable than those people are to these corporations, right? Um, assuming you're also spying on the individuals. Yeah, I, I have so, I have, I have such uh, skepticism about whether any of this data is, is, is really useful. Um, uh, and also the environmental impact that, um, that these server farms are having, although, frankly, um, you know, we're really entering a time where certain things can get baked in, and it's really quite alarming. Um, we can't, you can't, you know, so you have Amazon, you know, the Amazon Go, Yep. Where where you know human beings don't, aren't don't do any checkout. You just pick up the stuff and then 
and walk out the door, well, that's, that's pro worker because now they can't get infected. Right. And Walmart's been working on that too. Um, they also have similar things, but, uh, you know, I'm likely to agree with you, and this is a very, very long conversation, I, and I don't have the full view at all, but um, I'm likely to agree with you that the data is not as valuable um, and that it's sort of a house of cards, and I think we're going to see that, right? Um, that's part of what's going on right now in VCs and, and with the so-called unicorns and startups and so on. Um, you're going to see money not put into things that, that it was put into before. Um, but at the same time, if people are willing to pay for it, and by people, I mean, you know, powerful actors, um, then the data is worth something, right? So if my facial profile can be sold um, to a surveillance actor of some kind, right, the Amazons, the Googles, and so on, and they get their money from, you know, trillion dollar bailouts, right, because it's coming through Goldman Sachs or whoever it's coming through, when the money is being printed and the way it's being printed, um, then the concept of value is kind of um, different than the way that we think about it as being sort of normal people. Right, so this really leads us to the question of education. And what do our students need to know in order to navigate this, the new normal? So let's talk a little bit, we're going deep down the rabbit hole, which is great, uh, but let's talk a little bit about it. Um, so I'm going to bring in, uh, I guess I have to screen share because I think this PDF I made is pretty, pretty big. Um, and let's just talk about it for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. I know that uh, we're going to be over time on this, but there's nothing after it. So if the audience would like to stick around, that's great. Um, we're going to have it recorded either way. So, okay, let me to pull this in. Um, I'm leaving you <laughs> in the center. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me, I'm going to have to just uh, minimize a few things. My privacy stuff. Pull this out. And this tool, by the way, is pretty good. Um, Big Blue Button has been good to us. So um, I do want to say, uh, while everybody's in it and we're talking about, um, you know, big tech and the problems with Zoom and everything else, which is now big tech as well, Zoom, um, there are alternatives, there's replacements, but they are not necessarily the easiest thing to implement. It took us a while and, and some real generosity on the part of a Linux user, user group to really uh, get this set up. Although I have to say, it's, it's, it's really good. It's really, it was really easy to use. Actually, yeah. easier than Zoom, I should say. Well, so that's the other thing. I, I think a lot of these things can um, move more quickly to with less... Um, sort of meddling for other reasons. <laughs> you know, if uh, a bunch of open source people want to, um, hold on, I gotta just click on something. Uh, if a bunch of open source people, free and open source software people want to um, modify something, fork it, et cetera, they can do that, right? Um, so that's one of the reasons I love it too. A entire screen. And here we go. Can you see my entire screen? Probably. You probably see all kinds of other stuff. Okay, so this uh, this is a presentation um, that's a little big, but it's got a bunch of stuff um, that I just kind of compiled from from the last two years. So um, we taught this course uh, in 2018 together, um, and with the help of uh, Lauren Weisinger, who's not here. Um, and the three of us basically put this together. So um, this is what I have for the approach. What do you think of it, Scott? I, I, it works for me. Um, so, yeah. Um, right. So the 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 first thing um, was really the 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 the, the key, which was um, we. Everything was hands-on. I mean, we did lecture 
in the sense of explaining some very high level concepts, what's an operating system, how, how does network layers work, you know, OSI model, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, uh, it, everything was um, uh, connected to exercises in class. Uh, first, the first year we used uh, Raspberry Pis, uh, and then for various reasons that was difficult and then we use virtual box a virtual machine oh, hold um, that thought hold that thought yeah um because i have stuff to show so oh, these cool. are raspberry oh. pies um so little single board computers um here they are with their cute little cases and then which uh, which, uh sean had made with 3d printer these are not those cases but you're oh, the, oh okay yeah that's okay. These are the ones that actually came with it. But um, yeah, we, we ended up <laughs> modifying a lot of things down the line. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is a little screen, um, which these were, uh, I don't even recall where we got them. We got them from eBay. Um, but basically, these are little LCD screens that you can attach to pins on the Raspberry Pi. And you can get some output, which is critical, right? Um, one of the things I talked about when we were doing the privacy safe session and talking about the beagle bone um, is it advertises itself very easily as a Wi-Fi access point and you can connect to it. Um, but in a university setting, this Raspberry Pi, like how would you know what the IP address was, right? Or any idea. Um, so the screen was helpful, but you can already oh, see. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 you could, <laughs> I, we couldn't use it without the screen because you didn't, wouldn't know what your IP address was in order to S, uh, we SSH'd into it. So we had to, it, it was really critical. And we were we were setting these up um, each morning, <laughs> which was a task. <laughs> uh, but you can already see the cable starting to build up, which is going to be a continuing theme here. Um, and then this is the ideal network sort of diagram with pretty pretty icons that we had. Um, but we did use Kali Linux. Um, the version of the uh, Kali that we had was something that was modified we, called Pi Rogue. Um, made it easier to do certain types of things like uh, man in the middle proxy for the uh, cybersecurity folks in the audience. But in reality, this is what we ended up with. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's what it looked like, yeah. yeah. And it was fun, but um, yeah, after the first, uh, class that we taught it was just too much um yeah. so the following year and and the, doing the router and everything else was was a pain the following year we moved to um virtual machines um and that worked reasonably well what do you think scott i think it i, I mean it worked a thousand times better but it had its own uh glitches it was not nearly as seamless i mean partly I mean, virtual boxes just not as stable as uh, VMware, um, uh, or at least for us it wasn't. Um, but it was much better than the Pies, which, I mean, the thing is about Pi, you know, there, with hardware, it, stuff breaks, really breaks. I mean, like, literally the thing, the stuff breaks. And so that was really, we always had to, like, pull out extra ones and, um, and we just, by the way, thank the Hewlett Foundation because uh, they they helped fund buying these pies um, for the for for the students. Yeah, it was really helpful. But yeah, you're mm -hmm. right. I mean, it, it gets hot. So <laughs> literally, yeah. the machines would get hot. Um, yeah. So so for the first couple of weeks, basically, we were um, in the first year setting up the pies, uh, letting people get comfortable with the idea that these were mini computers, um, showing them how to use the command line. But I have the slides here of week four to six, and I think this is where things got interesting. So uh, if you could tell us a little about what you think of this, Scott, and sort of your ideas structuring the class. Yeah, so um, so f first of all, as you, as you mentioned, I like really taught the command line. So really taught them how to use your basic commands and switches and how we gave them exercises. They had to do exercises at home for homework. Um, and, and that was really kind of just on their own machine. And then we moved to the network and that, that introduced a whole nother set of concepts 
um, ideas of protocols, uh, the layers, um, you know, data layer, the network layer, the application layer. I mean, so it was it really introduced a whole new set of ideas with um, uh, different attacks, like as you, we, we did DDoS. That was one of the really fun things is that we DDoSed um, uh, the the pie at the in the front of the room, and I think that was just like the students really loved taking down. We we, we ran a website um, on the on the on the pie, and and the students took it down. And that was really fun, and then we did a man in the middle attack, and it was really um, uh, introduced a whole new set of ideas, and then things started getting trickier because after that we started talking about dns the domain name system is that is that the or is that the metasploit no this is this is dds it's a sin flood uh, okay it is yeah, so the, but yeah okay yeah we used so we did a, a sin flood um to knock off um the the web server that was running on the pi and that was really fun i mean i just like students like you just see their like jaws drop that they were able to do it um uh using a module in metasploit and that would that was really one of the it, you know as a teacher you live for those moments where they like, think oh my god power right and that was the we we all we because we did uh network analysis we talked about packets of course and then we we they ran Wireshark and we taught them how to use Wireshark and doing the packet analysis, um, which is ex extremely helpful because the way Wireshark shows how packets, uh, packet encapsulation works is really good. But I think this was where we saw the 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 SIN packets knock the knock the server offline. Right? Is that it? Yeah. That's exactly right. So this is sort of before we were introducing, I think, hard concepts. Um, we'll get into the pumpkin in a second. But um, so uh, DNS, all those concepts, um, we, I think part of the goal, right, was that we were taking law students, and it was really the main goal, um, and putting them through these, uh, that sounds like torture, um, empowering them through <laughs> these exercises. <laughs> Um, that were hands-on and so on. Um, but then we ended up having to talk about things that um, sort of have a, a really strong policy level um, implication, you know, or policy layer to them, right? Um, right. So uh, how do you think that went? With the, the policy stuff or the... Yeah, so the, when we talked about ownership of DNS servers and that kind of thing. Well, I, I think, like, you know... Um, whether I can't say whether it went well or not because I what I wasn't a student I think it went I wasn't a student in the class and I like to flatter myself that it went well um, but I will say one thing is that I don't know how you can possibly talk about the DNS issues without <laughs> understanding all this other stuff that we spend weeks building up to i mean it's it's um uh it's amazing to me that so much uh policy uh is discussed without understanding what the underlying technology looks like and i think that the students were very excited in the sense that they understood what we were talking about Whereas before, I think they would have, they had a clear sense that they wouldn't have known, they wouldn't have known they didn't understand what was being said. Sure. Yeah, I mean, generally, I, I, I feel the same way. Um, it's hard not to get sort of lost in those concepts. And um, I do think that because some folks were more comfortable there, um, we did probably spend a little more time um digging into that stuff um on those classes than i think we intended um, yeah i mean like so like the going dark debate we had spent an entire session going through the rsa algorithm right you know and i mean so like you know i mean they could they had a sense of what encryption was because we 
actually had them encrypting strings, not just encrypting strings in the sense of using a command line um, uh, um, function, but actually explaining them to them the algorithm that RSA is, right. you know, modular arithmetic and things like that. So they, they it was like, that's why, um, and it was just, I, I was just watching uh, the season finale of, um, of Silicon Valley, where they're talking about how the AI, their, their, their network um, broke encryption. Uh, I was like, what do you even, I mean, what are you even talking about? Your AI broke the encryption. <laughs> it's just not, that doesn't work. They had to, I don't know which yeah, that's actually usually, usually pretty good. Uh, yeah, it is actually. It's actually generally really good, but the but they really jumped the shark in the last episode. Not surprising. Um, okay, so um, seasonal hack. This was a fun one. This is something Lauren uh, brought in, and yeah. uh, basically it goes to show how you can have a cool seasonal cybersecurity theme thing. And we kept this for the second year, even though we weren't using pies for everyone because um, yeah. you don't need it. So this is a great yeah. example of, of IOT, so to speak, doing what it does well. Um, and we were, it was re really nice because Boing Boing uh, featured it um, on their web, uh, carried on their website. So that was really awesome. I think I, do I have that? But yeah. That was Corey Doctorow being uh, yeah. awesome. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, there's there's Lauren uh, with the pumpkin. And uh, we had a different pumpkin last year that was a little rougher. Yeah. But um, OK, so what is this, Scott? I, I don't know. I'm probably, I am I got some photos. I don't think I'm in any of them. So I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know what that is? First of all, I can't believe I'm wearing a button down shirt. That's weird. Um, but I think what we're um, doing is doing Metasploit. So we taught the students Metasploit, which is the largest, most sophisticated open source hacking platform. And I think here we were doing end mapping in order to figure out what services were running on, um, on the VM, which Metasploit uses called Metasploitable, which has vulnerabilities built in so you can figure out how to hack it. So I think I was just teaching them the, the various ways of um, uh, engaging in network surveillance. So uh, one of the fun things for the folks at home, which I've always wanted to say, uh, <laughs> the uh, Metasploit and Metasploitable um, together really do make something um, relatively simple that you can bootstrap pretty quickly um, for, for even a one-off boot, you, you know, like workshop event, I think, or a boot camp on the weekend, something like that. Um, it wasn't that hard to, for us to, to use at all. In, in no, I remember. <laughs> no, it, I mean, it's a, it's, it is, it's a fantastic platform and, um, uh, you know, the 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 people um, uh, who put it together did, have done a phenomenal job. Okay, and now let me zoom out for this. Um, so I think this is where we started to get into the societal um, issues a little more um, broadly. Um, so, um, Scott, do you want to take this? Why don't you? Well, I, you should do it just because this is your My stuff. Well, that's what I'm worried business. about, that I'm going to be, you know, have the wrong lens on it. But because um, <laughs> I'm obviously very biased, um, but I love Tor. And I think that uh, anonymity is a really important um, feature of network communication when we can have it um, and really vital to uh, privacy worldwide. Um, that's not to say that bad things can happen over... Um, the dark web, so to speak, which is why we have this um, interplay here. And uh, the first week, just from serendipity, um, Sherry Steele, who was at the time the, the TOR project, um, either I think director is the term, executive director is probably the correct way to say it, um, 
but yeah, she was gracious enough to come to the class. She was giving a, a talk with Privacy Lab um, later in the day. And I, I swear I didn't plan it, but it just happened to be the, uh, the week we were talking about onion routing, which was great. Um, so that was fun. And uh, we went through sort of all the good stuff. And then we talked about um, the bad stuff, which I think is the juicy thing that most people um, who are new to this are interested in. Um, so um, I don't know, Scott, where are you um, uh, mentally around cyber crime these days? Do you spend your time um, looking at this stuff? When you find the stuff, are you digging in or are you sort of turning away? I mean, so so I mean, it's as cybercrime is a big part of the of the history of the internet and internet hacking. But unlike other researchers, um, I don't really spend my time like following the you know various scams and um, botnets that are created. Um, uh, sometimes people really get into the weeds and they like the true crime nature of it. Um, I don't, I myself am not particularly interested. I don't spend a lot of, I don't spend any time actually um, on the dark web. Um, I think it's really interesting and cool. It's just not, it's not where my head is. Sure. So for me, um, yeah, I guess that true crime uh, nature of it is one of the reasons mm -hmm. I dig sometimes, you know? Um, yeah. You get sick of the breaches. The breaches are so often now. Right, I know. It's like, oh, another breach, another gazillion people, uh, you know, um, yeah. It's... But, yeah, and, and you know what? For me, it sort of created, and I will say this, you know, um, I'll use an analogy, I guess. I was really into uh, comic books when I when I was a kid, right? And then I sort of started reading, you know, more mature, good, good, you know, sort of literature comics, right? Not just sticking to the the standard superhero fare. Although there's some decent um, superhero stories as well, of course. Um, but then I kind of dropped it for a while, and and then you know, uh, in the last decade, with with the Marvel movies and everything blowing up, it's like this whole geek culture comics thing. And like, this is probably the first time I've talked about it in public, right? Um, in a long time, because I just can't, it's it's too inundating for me. And I think cybercrime is doing that for me. Um, yeah. When things were smaller and easier to sort of digest, it was just less, you know, constant, I guess. Yeah, it's like uh, you saw on Twitter uh, the hashtag, uh, ha uh, you know, Gates hacked, you know, like it was, he, right, he wasn't hacked, but even if he was, like, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I, I knew yeah. pretty immediately that that was fake, just by the way. Yeah, right. right. Um, but yeah, well, it's going to happen a lot to uh, this information sort of combined with all these issues, which is the whole, whole other ball act, network communication. Right. Uh, and brings something interesting here that's on that uh, chains of trust. Um, so we talked a lot about uh, implementation and, and um, differences between uh, different types of encryption. I think the theory didn't as much into with uh, last week. No. Okay. Then you did your whole essay analogy. Um, right on. Uh, you can just explain the essay analogy. See if I can find the slide for that. Because that could be fun to share. Well, yeah, I'm just trying to explain so much of our the RSA, um algorithm depends on what's called modular arithmetic, um, which is. Um, a way of doing uh, a, a, a modulus is um, what's left over, what the remainder is when you uh, divide by a certain number. And it's like um, uh, the clock, if you divide by 12, um, you can get a remainder of like one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. And so when, what, what, what I tried to show the students was like in order to crack um, a certain site RSA cipher 
you have to figure out the the astronomical number of times you have to walk around this huge huge circle to stop at a certain point on the circle um and visually you you just got a sense of like oh my god like the 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 amount of computing power you would need in order to figure in order to crack that seems like impossible because the thing about the the the, the circumference of this uh, of the circle you know was so large you know like um uh had a big big base and a ridiculously large exponent and that's how large the circle was and then you have to figure out how many times you would walk around a circle that big and then stop at a certain part of the circle. And it's like, you just, it, it, it was a visual way of trying to explain a kind of a complex mathematical idea. I think kind of drove home why encryption of a certain size is so difficult to crack. Sure. Um, now I can find sort of a diagram, which I think will better better explain that. It's not yours, though, <laughs> but right. best I can do. Um, and then we'll just um, sort of wrap up here. Uh, thank you for hanging in uh, with us. This is really fun, I think, for Scott and I. But also, we'd like to sort of hear from you about what you think about our pedagogical approach, to use the fancy language. Uh, <laughs> And, and sort of any of the other stuff we've been talking about. So so here's the circle. Um, and, and the idea being the numbers get so huge, it's just astronomical to try to brute force this thing, right? All right, yeah, I don't think we see the circle, or at least I don't see the circle, but. Oh, geez, okay, hold on. This is one of the things, I, one of the, the pedagogical lessons about anything having to do with computers, but certainly hacking, is that nothing ever works. <laughs> like it just you know the, like that that any that anything any hack works is amazing because you know doing anything directly is so hard that like hacking involves bank shotting and <laughs> the, 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 like no matter how how many times you you rehearse it like some little thing has changed and that will kind of mess you up right and i'm, I'm 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 amazed that that anything ever works. All oh, right, yeah. So, yeah, that wasn't my circle, but it was. It's a circle. It's you know, a circle, right? People got the idea. But the point is, you can express these concepts in ways that are visual, which I think did help a lot. Um, yeah. And we actually did the clock face thing with uh, tape, uh, which was fun. Um, yeah, right. As an exercise, where where people. Um, or what did you do? You put the numbers around the classroom and walked around the class? Yeah. That's what yeah. we did. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. And uh, then um, I think this is just showing. Um, yeah, this, uh, this was, um, what was this was one of the, this is a public key. Yep. And I think that's a public key. Try to show them like just you're just talking about numbers that are that are so large that um you know there's the you'd, you'd need you know thousands of years to crack it or something and then we did a little bit of threat modeling but not really uh, we talked about kill chain um i recall that um oh, yeah. and it's sort of a new new concept to you um i guess it's a good place to wrap also um how do you feel about that as a concept? Do you think um, that's a, a good thing for uh, framing at the end, at the beginning? Did we put it in the right place, do you think? Yeah, I, so the, the, the idea of a kill chain is that, this is at least for me why I think it's a useful idea, is that when you talk about a hack, it sounds like it's one thing you did. It's like you pushed the button and that was the hack, but in fact, hacks are these temporally extended activities that involve lots and lots of lots of um, steps um, of building upon 
various types of um, intrusions, gaining information, engaging in further surveillance, escalating privileges, again, gathering more information. It, it's, it, there, there's, a, there's a way in which um, uh, things are so, there's so many steps involved that um, uh, so many things have to go right in order for the intrusion to happen. And, you know, it does feel like um, uh, when you go through the steps, you realize how difficult it is to hack and how many chances there were to stop it um, and that's the and from the policy perspective is incredibly important because the question is what is the most efficient or privacy protecting or security protecting way to intervene at what stage does it make sense to intervene along the kill chain also just people like the word kill chain it's yeah kind of sounds sounds cool yeah. Awesome. Well, um, okay. I think that's a, a good good uh, sort of transition here. Let's just answer a couple of questions real quickly from the mm -hmm. um, public chat or talk about it. Uh, Jay Beal has been very active here, and I know um, he's a cybersecurity professional, so uh, oh. has a good perspective and sort of uh, keeping us in check a little bit, I'm sure. Um, crypt crypto jacking apparently does make a, a quite a bit of money. Um, Maybe not ransomware, maybe ransomware. I don't know. I have to look through this huge thread that thank you all for having such a lively discussion. Um, but yeah, what do we have? Somebody liked the self-driving cars comment. Okay. <laughs> um, Somebody made $200,000 per day doing crypto jacking? That's, that's apparently it, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me that there's really enterprising uh, folks out there, right? Um, hmm. Well, this is a lot to dig through, and I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> but I guess we'll just say um, thank you all for, for that, and um, I'll be around... Uh, pretty much all day tomorrow. So if you can drop into the Matrix channels and um, chat with me, I'm happy to keep explaining or, or having the conversation with you. And uh, thank you, Scott. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Sean. And I, I really appreciate it. And, um, and um, take care, everyone. Thank you.